Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, two of the three lessons are talking about uh, people who are called by God. And so uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, later during the sermon and talk about being called by God. Uh, can we bow our heads in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everything. We thank you for all that you give us, all that you do for us, how that you protect us. You're with us always. Help us to recognize the times when uh, you're calling us to do things that are totally in your will. Keep our hearts and minds open to the call. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Please rise for the opening hymn. <clears throat> We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. 
let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. <clears throat> Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, falling to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, as you call to follow you, comes to us through your word. Grant us your Holy Spirit, for we trust and serve you in repentance and faith. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Jonah, chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days, and Nivea will be overthrown. And the Nivevites believed God. A feast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord.
Good morning. A reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul writes, What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not, those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. After John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for the sermon.
morning again, everyone. Today I'd like to talk to you about God's call. God calls us in many ways. There's many ways that we can hear his voice. Uh, I would ask all of you to think, have you ever been called by God? Have you ever been felt that God is asking you to do something? God is asking you to be somewhere, to help somebody, to take on some job, to do anything. Have you ever felt that God's voice was speaking to you? Well, today, the first lesson is about Jonah. And if you look at that one, the word says in the scripture, it says, and the word came to Jonah to do something. Now, the lesson that we read is only the second half of Jonah. It's the part where he actually does what God asked him to do. The first part of Jonah was that the first time he was called, and God called him to go to Nineveh and tell the people in Nineveh that they got 40 days to repent of all their sins to shape up or God is going to destroy them. Now, you have to understand the context of this. The question would be to me if I was reading that, and by the way, you can, if you read Jonah, it should only take you like 10 minutes because I think there's only four chapters of Jonah. The question I would have is why didn't Jonah want to go? Jonah was a prophet of God. Why, why did he decide that he was going to run away from God, that he wasn't going to go? Well, you have to understand the context of everything. Nineveh is, was in Assyria, which is somewhere around where Syria is now in Iraq is. And the Israelites had just gotten out from under the thumb of Assyria. For the first time in a long time, the Israelites, the nation of Israel, under God, because God had helped them drive out the Assyrians, was now a nation again, and Assyria wasn't there. So Jonah, many of the things that I've read, was kind of feeling like, this is our God. God is our God. The God that's calling me is our God. He's the God of Israel. He's not the God of these people. Why is he sending me to save these people? Why is he sending me there to let these people go? These people are the bad guys. So my God, the God of Israel, is sending me someplace to do something. So he didn't want to go. So what does he do as the story goes along? He finds a ship that'll take him, and he's heading for Tarsus. Now, Tarsus, in those times, was where Spain is. So he was on a ship that was going just about as far in the Mediterranean as you could get from Israel. That's where he was headed for. He just wasn't headed down the road a little ways. He was headed as far away as he could get from what God was telling him. And then, of course, the story goes on that he's on the ship, and so God still wants him to go. So God sends this storm. The storm is crashing around the ship. All the sailors are getting all upset. They're praying to their gods. And they ask him who his God is. And he said, my God is the God of land and sea. So now they said, well, if he's your God, well, then start praying to him, all right, to save us. He really doesn't care. He doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to go back because if he goes back, God, and he gets saved, he's going to have to do what God wants him to do. In the meantime, they decide of whose fault. Well, then it must be his fault because his God's the God of land and sea. So they, they uh, draw lots and they find out and they throw him overboard. He says, that's good with him. He wants to go. So they throw him overboard. And what happens to him after that? God takes him and he's put in the mouth or inside a big fish. And the big fish swims back to Israel. And how many days is he in the, in the fish? Does anybody know? Three days. Three is a very symbolic figure. God is absolutely amazing. The more you read God, the more you read the scripture, the more you listen to what he's saying, he uses symbolic things over and over and over again. He's in the fish for three days. Who else do we know was in something for three days? Jesus, right? So anyway, now we pick up the story where we actually read it this morning. So now he's cast back on the land, and God calls him again. He calls him the second time. 
at this time, grudgingly, but this time, he goes, Jonah goes to Nineveh. He gets to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is a pretty big city. According to what I read is that at that time, the city was probably like 60 miles around, so it encompassed a lot of stuff. There was 120,000 people in this city. It took him three days to get through the city. He goes through the city preaching and saying that you got 40 days to shape up. If you don't shape up, God is going to destroy you. And what happens? Miraculously, the king, from the king on down, they all repent of their sins. It says they put on sackcloth and ashes, a demonstration of their repentance and their sin, even to the point where they put it on their animals. The, everybody in the city uh, that's alive, literally, is covered with sackcloth and ashes to show God that they're repenting. So God repents and God doesn't destroy them. So at the end of the story, what happens to uh, Jonah? Well, he's sitting outside the city in the sun because he's angry at God. He's still angry that God did this. His God took care of these people. So he's sitting outside in the sun, and the final part of the story is, is that God has a plant grow that shades him from the sun, which he's very happy about, except the next day, God sends a worm to destroy the plant. Well, why does he do that? Why would we even see that written in there? What is that all about? God is showing him who he is. And so don't get angry about sitting in the sun because... I put the plant there, and I took the plant away. So that's the story of Jonah. So Jonah was called by God. Again, didn't say exactly. It just said the word came to Jonah. So Jonah was called by God to do something. And he didn't do it. <laughs> he was reluctant to do it, but then finally did it. Now, one last interesting thing, historical thing about Nineveh, who has ever read the book of Nahum? Anybody? It's two books, comes in the Bible, two books after Jonah. It's about the same length as Jonah. And you know what it's about? It's about the destruction of Nineveh. Two generations later, Nineveh is not wearing sackcloth and ashes. They've gone back to their old ways. And that one book written by the prophet all right, Nahum is a description of the destruction of Nineveh. So, even though God let them go because Jonah went there and preached to them, two generations later, they're gone. So, look at the book sometime. It only takes you like 10 minutes to read it, less than 10 minutes to read it. It's just an interesting fact. So, that were called. The other lesson that we learned today, or that we read today, was about Jesus calling his disciples. Walking along the lake and calling them. That's a really interesting story in the sense that all he did is say, follow me. And they followed him. They left everything. They dropped everything. Can you picture yourself doing that? Can you picture yourself being at work and somebody comes along and says, Follow me. Go with me. That's kind of hard to visualize, except for the fact that it was God speaking to them, God speaking to their hearts, God speaking to their hearts, their minds, and their souls, and obviously they knew that they needed to follow him. So let's talk about us. What do we do? What do we do about when God calls us or speaks to us in some particular way? Well, I believe one of the first ways God calls us is maybe when we're baptized, we're called to baptism. Well, we baptize little children, little babies. How can little babies be called? Well, maybe this is one of those cases where we are not as a baby specifically called, but the parents of the baby are. How many baptisms have you seen where the parents know they need to get that baby baptized? God has touched their hearts and minds and soul and said baptize that baby and a lot of times you never ever see the parents again maybe you never ever see the baby again but the point is 
God tells them, baptize that baby. So they're called by God to bring that baby to baptism, even if they're not back there again to stay back there with, with everyone. So there's many ways that we can be called. Now this scripture tells us of all the different ways that God has called people over time. Sometimes he calls people through angels. Look at Mary. He sends an angel to Mary specifically and tells her, we want you to be the mother of God. All right, so she's called by an angel who's standing in front of her. Sometimes people are called in dreams. What was Joseph? What happened to Joseph, right? Didn't God come to him and say, the scripture says he came to him in a dream and says, you better get out of here and you better go to Egypt. Bring, take your family and go to Egypt. And the wise men, we just finished through Christmas, they were told not to go back through a dream. Have you ever had God talk to you in a dream? Do you know when God's talking to you in a dream? All right, so maybe the dream came to them to, that was the way that God was calling them to do something. What are some of the other ways calls? He calls us through other people, as I said, in baptism. Hasn't sometime maybe in your life someone has said something to you about doing something or just said something offhand and you just felt moved that you needed to move in that particular direction? That can be God calling you. I think God calls us, and so he calls us through Scripture when we read the Scripture. He calls us through preaching. I've told a number of times in the years in, as I've been preaching the story of my my uh, niece being in the county jail and I was so angry that she was there that I, I wouldn't go see her. I didn't want to go see her. I said she got herself in trouble tough. And I was sitting out there, sitting right back there and what was the story that was being preached? I had heard it of many, many times of where were you when I needed food? Where were you when I needed clothes? Where were you when I was in prison? Wow, it was like, it was like some stabbed me right in the heart and said, yeah, Harvey, where were you? You got somebody in prison. What are you doing sitting there? That week, I went to the prison to see her. I could, I could not reject that. And that simply came to something that I had heard many times. I had read those verses, but it was preached that day and it went right to my heart. And so I know that. So a lot of times through preaching, through somewhat preaches to us, somewhat we read in the scriptures of, of uh, ways that, that do us. How about hear, actually hearing his voice? In the, in the case of Jesus calling the disciples, it was Jesus, was God calling to them. Have you ever heard God call you in a voice? By the way, any of these things I'm asking you, I would hope that sometime if some of these things have happened to you, that at some point you come up to me and tell me about them. I think they're really interesting, that people. Well, I know Peggy, my wife, has told me a number of times that she's heard God call her name. Jimmy, a couple of weeks ago, said that God woke him up 5.30 in the morning, called his name, called Jimmy. He didn't call him James, he called him Jimmy. <laughs> Wake up. So God can call us by actually calling our name. He can talk to us in so many ways. What I'm trying to say today, what I'm trying to talk about today, is I'm just trying to talk about us being more open to that. Being more open to what God says. I mean, so many times we do talk to God in prayer. But most of the time, I believe, if any of you are like me, other than I always thank God, I'm usually asking God for stuff. I'm asking God to take care of somebody. I'm praying for somebody. I want somebody to get healthy. I want, I'm always asking God for something. I really, it's hard for me just to sit there and say, okay, now I'm going to listen, Good, tell me, talk to me. I'm just going to sit here and listen to you. That's not usually the way I pray. I'm usually... I thank God for everything that he's done. I ask for forgiveness of my sins, and then I give him my long list of people that I want to pray for or things I want to pray for. So that communication is not always, I know on my part, 
is not always, I'm just going to sit here for a half an hour now, and I'm not going to do anything, I'm going to listen for you. I don't usually do that. So we don't usually do that. So I think when God's trying to get our attention, he tries it many different ways. For me, the story that I've told about the time I was angry at Pastor Meyer and I came down to church and I was going to go into his office and I was going to yell at him because he took, he was considering a second call to Garden City and that whole story. And it, I'm sure you've heard me tell it before, but that was the time as walking across the parish hall. I felt like something was poured over top of my head. I could f have this feeling. It's the only time this ever happened to me. But it was clear to me that God was speaking to me and he poured this right over my head. It felt like it just went right down my body to my toes. And when that finished, I knew what God said to my heart. Sit down, shut up, this is what I want to happen. All right? Stop getting angry, stop <laughs> hollering. When you get down there, it's, this is what I want. Why do you think I had him called twice? <laughs> it's kind of like uh, Jonah. Why do you think I called him twice? because I want him to go. God was telling me, this is what I want. Now, it's the only time in my life that it's been that obvious to me. I do believe God leads us in many different directions, a little more subtly than that sometimes, but that was just so obvious to me. So I guess what I wanted you to think about tonight is, uh, today is being more open to what God is saying to you. Try harder to listen to God. God works through people. God works through prayer. God works through scripture. God works through circumstances. God works through so many ways that he is constantly, I believe, communicating with us. We do not spend as much time listening to the communication as that I think that we should. So please try from this point on to be more open to that so that we can all be on the same page, so that we can be unified, so that we're all moving forward in the same direction. Because God is speaking to us and helping us to be focused on what He wants. Not what we want, but what He wants us to do and the way He wants us to go. And finally, I would just want to read you something out of this. This is one of my favorite little books. And by the way, this is another way God can talk to you. All right? These are devotions. Devotions. God can talk to you through a devotion. I mean, that might be the simplest thing, that you, you read a devotion and that changes your whole direction because something in that devotion spoke to you. Well, these two women copied down what God was saying to them. Jesus was talking to them, and they copied it down, and we use it as a devotion. And so I want to finish by reading this one last one here. It says... Very quietly I speak. Listen to my voice. Never heed the voices of the world, only the tender divine voice. Listen, and you'll never be disappointed. Listen, and anxious thoughts and tired nerves will become rested. The voice divine, not so much in strength as in tenderness, not so much in power as in restfulness. But the tenderness and restfulness will heal your scars and make you strong. And then it must be your task to let all your power be my power. Man's little power is as clay beside the granite rock of my power. You are my great care. Never feel at the mercy of the world. My angels guard you day and night and nothing can harm you. You would indeed thank me if you knew the darts of fret and evil they turned from you. Thank me indeed for dangers unknown, unseen, but averted. Amen. Can we rise for our profession of faith? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, for pastors and teachers, for deacons and for musicians and servers, that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love. Lord, in your mercy, for skies and stars and favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God raise up advocates and scientists to guide our care for all the earth. Lord, in your mercy, for those who provide leadership in our cities and around the world for nonprofit and non-governmental organizations, for planning commissions and homeless advocates, that God inspire all people in the just use of wealth. Lord, in your mercy, for our congregation and community, for families big and small, that God's steadfast love serve as a model for all relationships. Lord, in your mercy. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcast and all who wait relief. Today we offer up prayers, continued prayers for Robin and the family for comfort and strength. Continued prayers for Dee, Barbara, Curry, and Gloria, all being treated for cancer issues. Continued prayers for the homeless and all who are in need that come to our community meal. Prayers for Emmanuel as we come together for our congregational meeting. We pray for love, peace, wisdom, and direction. Continued prayers for Rob, Susan, Lucy, Pris, Alex, Laura, Jeff, Eric, and Annabelle. And finally, for the family of Greg Wilson, whose mother passed on yesterday. That in the midst of suffering, God's peace and mercy surround them. Lord, in your mercy. In thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith, whose lives serve as an example of gospel living, that they point us to salvation through Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we have two announcements today. The first one is that immediately following this service is the congregational meeting. Be there to be part of the life of the church and make decisions. And the second thing is I'd like to turn the floor over to Kathy with a brief announcement. real fast um, on behalf of the call committee the written part of the self survey has been completed council has approved it Monday night at our meeting and it is on its way to Bishop Lee cakes and you still have to wait so please be patient and keep praying for the church and for our earthly shepherd here for Emmanuel and we'll keep you posted thanks Thanks, Kathy. Please, at this time, put your offerings in the plates on the corners.
please rise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. Sharing our life, he lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness would give way to his own brilliant light. And so with the church on earth and the hosts in heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We recall the words spoken by the pastor when these elements were consecrated during the service of Holy Communion at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to the disciples saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Body of Christ.
When it's all been said and done There is just one thing that matters Did I do my best to live for true? Did I live my life for you? When it's all been said and done All my treasures will mean nothing Only what I've done for love's reward Will stand the test of time Your mercy is so great That you look beyond our weakness And find purest gold in my clay, Turning sinners into saints Hallelujah And I will always sing your praise On earth and ever after For you've shown me heaven's my true home When it's all been said and done You're my life when life is gone Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace.
Go in peace. Be the light of Christ.